And as I know, she has more than 10 years, about 15 years experience in working with uh, multilingual groups. Uh, so I suppose she has a huge experience in this specific topic and we are welcome that she um, agreed today to uh, share her experience in this specific topic. So Teresa, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rasa. Thanks for your nice uh, introduction. Labadiana. Hello, hello, everyone, dear colleagues. Guten Tag. Ciao a tutti. Buenos dias. Tere. Dzień dobre. And maybe we could continue on and on with all these different languages that we all know. Uh, so today, thanks for your time. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Thank you for being with, with us today. And uh, as uh, Rasa has already told, my name is Teresa uh, Rengailene. I work at the Institute of Foreign Languages. Now I hold an administrative position. Uh, however, what I really love doing is teaching. And um, I'd also like to share my my experience, um, some of my uh, insights of uh, working with multilingual, multicultural groups. I'll be also sharing some initiatives that we have at the Institute of Foreign Languages and at Vitotas Magnus University in general. I do hope, I do believe that you you will also share your ideas, you will also share your experiences, and we will have a nice sharing and, and a nice discussion at the end of my presentation. Um, actually, I'd like to find out a little bit about you as well. And that's why I'd like to start with a question. Um, for the question, uh, or just to answer my question, let's try out uh, menti meter. Please enter menti.com. Please enter this code that I hope you can see on my screen now. And there's a question. Do you teach multilingual, multicultural, classes. I see six people have already responded. Thank you so much. OK, I hope everything works from the technical side. You can find the link or, as I've said, simply use menti.com and please enter this code. Eight answers. Amazing. And nine answers. Wonderful. And it seems we're on the same wavelength, right? We are uh, we all experience this amazing, I would say, opportunity. We all teach multilingual and multicultural groups. Um, I'm not sure if we should wait for more answers because I have one more question for you. And the next question would be, what words come to your mind if you hear a multilingual or multicultural class or group? Here, I would ask you to enter at least a couple of words that that come to your mind. And again, I hope that everything's working well from the technical side. If not, please let us know. Okay, we already have 
two words, diversity and creativity. OK, thank you so much. Let's wait for more words. It can be any word, a noun, an adjective, um, a verb. Challenges, more, one more word that has appeared. Thank you very much. OK, more words have have popped up. Amazing. Our cloud is getting bigger and bigger. So far we've got unique. You have experience. We have hard work and most probably we all should admit that's true. Um, atmosphere, different backgrounds understanding, creativity, variety, richness, fun, amazing multilingualism, challenge, perceptions, context, challenges once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, really, really um, great words, great, great impressions, uh, great accurate ways most probably of describing a uh, multilingual mul multicultural class if you ask me um or what i would mention i would definitely uh, mention diversity i would uh, definitely uh, mention unique because the i suppose this is a unique experience uh, to me as a person and as a teacher um, of course, challenges. Sometimes it's a real challenge to deal with all these different perspectives, to deal with all of this um, variety and, of course, creativity. Um, we definitely have to be uh, creative. We definitely have to be uh, inventive to be able uh, to uh, work uh, with uh, such a uh, class, with with such a group. Now, I hope you can uh, see uh, my slides again. The things, as I've mentioned, that um, I'm going to talk about and to share with you today is my experience uh, and the experience of the Institute of Foreign Languages on how to develop, how to encourage multilingualism in class. And mainly I'll be talking about uh, three aspects. First, in class activities um, or the, the possibilities that could be used in class. Um, then extracurricular or non-formal education activities. Uh, in my opinion, this is a, very, a really rich way of um, learning languages and um, quite a new concept, compassionate linguistics, that um, I will explain what it means and how we can understand it a little bit later on. Um, why do I want to talk about all this? As uh, Rasa has already mentioned, um, I've worked um, with multilingual, multicultural groups for 14 years. When I started working at Vitotas Magnus University, I started um, as an English uh, teacher, lecturer, and um, I've also taught Lithuanian as a foreign language for 12 years. Um, all this started um, Kind of accidentally, um, I, I was helping my PhD supervisor uh, teaching Lithuanian at a language summer course, and um, I tried it, and frankly, I fell in love with it. And this love has continued for many years already. I started teaching Lithuanian um, as a foreign language during the semester, and um, I started learning from my students a lot. 
of course, at the very start, um, I was focusing on grammar. I was focusing on um, vocabulary. Um, I was focusing on uh, some um, uh, historical, some cultural issues related to the Lithuanian language and culture. Um, and little by little, um, I started making more and more parallels, more and more comparisons between or among different languages and different cultures. Why or how come? Um, well, my students, first of all, are really inquisitive and they usually ask a lot of questions about not only about the language, but also about the culture, about the traditions. Um, they started sharing um, their ideas just naturally. Um, and you know, in my language, it's like this and that. Or, you know, in my culture, we have such and such customs, such and uh, such tradition. And when I was sharing the things that are Lithuanian, I, I noted surprise in their eyes. Um, as I mentioned, I started making more comparisons, more parallels myself. I started encouraging discussions. And I was learning from my students a lot. From all this, what I've learned, um, you can see only the cover of uh, my book, Learn and Speak Lithuanian. This is a book published in 2020. Um, it, um, it, it, it's devoted to people of A1, A2 level who would like to learn uh, Lithuanian. Uh, and mainly, I'll be giving examples from this um, textbook. However, if you teach some other, of course, you teach some other subjects, you, maybe you teach not only languages, maybe you teach some other subjects and you have to deal with multilingual, multicultural classes. I do hope that some of the ideas could be used and could be applied in your context. Now, as for my context, uh, here you can see a table and uh, students in uh, my only um, my Lithuanian A1 classes. Um, four semesters, um, the uh, pandemic year and then um, this academic year. So the number of students uh, varies from uh, 16 to 20 and uh, they represent various countries and various languages. You can see the countries that they come from um, here. And um, I should uh, also add here that um, the interest in the Lithuanian language has been increasing a lot. Um, usually uh, there are two or three A1 groups and also we teach A2, B1, and this semester we've also had B2 level of Lithuanian as a foreign language. Um, now, so what could we do? What's possible to do uh, in class? We have all this amazing group uh, from people uh, from all over the world and what could we do? How could we encourage um, multilingualism? Um, idea that, well, the first idea would be to have some class rituals. What you can see here is um, greeting, uh, greeting saying happy birthday in four different languages. We usually have this tradition in the summer course. Um, during the semester, I don't have the chance, I don't have the possibility to find out about um, the birthdays of each of my students. But in the summer course, you know, it's a little bit more re relaxed. And what we usually do is um, either we uh, create a card um, with greetings in various languages or uh, during the pandemic when we were working online, uh, we were using um, the chat box and the person could see, could also hear uh, the greetings. 
Another possibility, another option would be to have some greeting ritual, right? Um, saying hi in various languages, saying thank you in different languages, uh, saying excuse me in uh, different languages as well. Um, this could be agreed in advance. This could be something spontaneous. Well, for example, if uh, some Italian comes to my class, I could um, say ciao, come stai. Uh, if um, uh, someone from uh, Germany, for example, uh, joins my, my class, I can say hello or guten Tag, guten Morgen and so on and so forth. What's the use? Well, of course, it brightens the day and definitely broadens um, our understanding and our linguistic abilities. What you can see here is uh, an example of the postcard that I received myself from my students. And here you can see um, the words thank you in uh, various languages. So this is how it works, how it looks in practice. If we move on to other activities, other in-class activities, we could try out an experiment. Please have a look at the words here. These are the words in Lithuanian. And could you please tell me or could you please write um, in me in, in the chat box? Which of these words do you recognize? I'm not sure if you all have uh, the chat box. Maybe you could just Tell me some ideas about the meanings of these words. I mean, those of you who are not Lithuanians. How about cukrus? Can we decipher the meaning of the word cukrus? I I'm, unfortunately don't see the chat now, but I do hope, I do believe you can guess or you can come up with uh, with an idea that that's sugar. Uh, for, um, then, for example, maybe you can recognize you've heard sliva, yeah, which is a plum in English. But if uh, someone knows Slavic languages, I'm sure you could guess the word. Pipiri, if you think that this is Pepper, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm sure bananas does ring a bell, right? Pomodoras, just it's not pomodoro, but it's pomodoras. So the adapted version. Yogurtas, yeah? chocolates, yeah? chocolates, uh, chesnakas. Again, if you speak Slavic languages, I'm sure you can mm, recognize uh, the word. Um, Vishne. Kopustas. So I'm not sure how successful uh, you've been in this guessing game, but the idea and the conclusion is that you may not know Lithuanian, but you may recognize some words. And what do I do with all this? I group my students uh, into small groups of three or four people. I try to make sure that uh, they represent different countries and different languages. And um, of course, before we start the group work, we clarify that by piano producte, we mean diary products, mesa, meat, different kinds of meat, vaisi, uh, fruit, wagos, berries, daržovės, vegetables, and so on. And in the group, they have to ascribe these words to one or another category. Usually it's a, an absolutely fun activity. Why? Because someone has seen some word already 
in Kaunas or in some other Lithuanian city when traveling. Um, others have something very similar in their native language. And what happens is that people cooperate. People, students share. Uh, they even try to guess and they also share the words in their native languages. So the final outcome first, of course, is um, the activity, the exercise. Second, um, my students also see how similar some languages can be. Um, and they also see the, 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 the note, uh, or I, I, I tell them, or we've come to the conclusion that those students who come from Slavic countries or who know, who speak Slavic languages, they can recognize a lot of words. Why? Because of our common history. Um, of course, for my students who come from Asian countries, um, it's, it, it's a complete nightmare, let's admit. Uh, they usually don't find, they usually don't see any similarity. Um, okay. Then um, another exercise um, that uh, could be used is it's also related to food. Uh, in this exercise, uh, students review uh, some words related to food and they also review grammar, um, trying to make sentences, trying to come up with uh, different uh, cases that they need, need depending on the verb. Yeah, these are verbs which mean like, they like, they don't like, often eat, don't eat or don't drink. And um, on the surface, it can be something very simple and um, only focused on the Lithuanian um, grammar, but um, a follow up activity or an additional activity could be to talk, for example, about names. Uh, let's say the guy here in Lithuanian, this is Andrus. Um, if I ask you, well, do you do you recognize the name? Do you um, have a variant of this name in your language? Well, I hope, I suppose, we'd come up to some ideas, like for example, um, Andrew or Andrei. Um, we could also talk which names are common, are typical in one or another language, in one or another country. And uh, just to give more examples, um, we could also speak about Jonas uh, in Lithuanian, and Janis, Juan, John, Giovanni in other languages, or in Lithuanian, Patras, and Peter, Peter um, in other languages. So this is again is uh, not only a matter of language, but also cultural things. What is typical? What is uh, what names are untypical in one or another? country. Um, months. Um, well, if you just look at the picture, you may think, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what is that? How are months, uh, like January, February, March, um, April, May, related to all this? However, in Lithuanian, they, th these pictures are really re related to um, the months. Why? Well, for example, um, I'm sure mm, we know, well, in English it's May, um, in um, other languages that could be Mai or Majo, Mayo, and in Lithuanian it's Geguzie, which is this bird, a cuckoo. So the idea is that when the students learn months, yeah, this is a way to go over them again to refresh their memory. Um, this is one thing, uh, let's say um, a birch, 
and in Lithuanian, Birzhelis, which means June, or Linden tree, yeah, uh, Linden, and Liapa in Lithuania. What could follow up or what's next? How can we transform it, uh, modify it to a multilingual activity? Well, again, in pairs, students share, students discuss the words that refer for months in their native languages. And for some of them, yeah, they, they can find lots of similarities. Um, let's say from the languages that are based on Latin. However, um, Ukrainian students are really, really surprised because we share something very similar. Yeah, the months, the words that refer to months uh, in Lithuanian and in Ukrainian are very similar. So what they can do, they can translate um, the they can discuss, they can translate the words in their native language and then just come up with the idea. So what's different? How come the words are so different? Um, one more exercise that could uh, lead to sharing, not only about linguistic uh, matters, not only about linguistic issues, but also cultural things, Mm, this is the exercise where the students have to write the dates. Uh, they learn the months, sources, well, this means January. Uh, they learn how to make ordinal numbers. Um, and on the one hand, this is just a sample exercise to write the date. However, these days, these days are somewhat special in Lithuanian. How come? Well, for example, uh, January the 13th is uh, the Freedom Defenders Day in Lithuania. February the 16th, uh, this is um, the restoration, um, sorry, the uh, State Restoration Day. Uh, let's say um, um, September the 1st is the uh, Day of Science and Knowledge in Lithuania. So there's something special about the day and something special about the celebration, which leads to another point. So what are the special days in your country? Um, what's special about it? Do, do you have an Independence Day? Do you have uh, some, um, let's say, Statehood Day as we do have in Lithuania? Uh, in your culture, in your um, environment, do you celebrate Christmas or Christmas Eve? Maybe yes, maybe no. In your culture and in your country, do you celebrate St. John's Festival or Ioannines in uh, Lithuania? So um, this is the the exercise. This is the activity um, that's that's really interesting both to me and my students because they discover lots of things um, about each other, about the history, about the culture. We can find uh, countries that, well, don't have something like the Independence Day. Um, Christmas is not celebrated everywhere, or the, the, the way we celebrate may be really different. St. John's Festival, even though it sounds a religious festival, but in Lithuania it has many pagan traditions. And in, in some other countries, in Latvia, for example, or uh, Ukraine, it, it's celebrated in a very similar way. So uh, these were some examples uh, that that I use in in, in class, and um, I've 
I want you to hear my students' perspective. Of course, I hear them when we uh, do these exercises, uh, when we discuss, when we share, but I, I also wanted to them to express their, uh, their opinions in a questionnaire. So, of course, there were more questions, but what's, what's interesting and relevant here and now uh, is the statement, Lithuanian lectures helped me improve my knowledge about other languages and cultures. And I was really glad to see that 100% uh, percent of uh, my students this semester agree with the statement. This means they learned not only uh, Lithuanian as a foreign language, but they also expanded their horizons. They also found out a lot or at least a tiny bit about other languages and about other cultures. I have also asked my students to explain their answers and you can see some of them here. Uh, the language has not been corrected, by the way. So um, one of the students says that during lectures we were encouraged uh, to share our own experiences and culture talking about national food and, and traditions. Of course, food is so important and, and how it's different from Lithuanian. Here I could also add that I've asked my students to make presentations on their uh, national um, food and uh, what, what they usually eat or usually drink um, in, in different seasons, during different time of the day and so on. Um, another student expressed the opinion that it was interesting to learn about Lithuanian history and culture and about cultures and languages of classmates as well. Thanks for these discussions. And one more idea, one more opinion that I, I learned a lot during our lessons, not only about Lithuanian culture and history, but also about connections with other cultures and similarities to at first sight different languages. And I suppose this idea describes it very, very accurately that at the first sight, um, languages may seem so different, so distant, but still we can find some similarities. And what, what really fascinates me is like finding these connections, finding these bonds. Um, so you may ask then, OK, um, well, why? Why multilingual activities in class? Mm, I would say that they develop, of course, the skills of the language that the students are studying. Definitely, yes. But in, in addition to that, they develop linguistic competence. They uh, develop intercultural skills. They encourage cooperation. They encourage mediation when you have to explain one or another concept um, or idea to each other. And um, of course, attention is given to everyone's language and culture. Um, this is what we call linguistically sensitive uh, teaching. Um, I'm not sure if, if you are familiar with, um, with the term, but um, this means that we should focus or this is the, the the right thing to pay attention to everyone's language and culture not only mine uh, but also all of my students um okay and now let's move on to something else to another uh point in in my presentation extracurricular uh, or activities or non-formal education activities. Um, well, a little bit of um, prehistory. Um, uh, so it, it definitely happens that um, students start asking, like, so how is it in Lithuania? How do you celebrate it? What do you do? What do you eat? Etc. Etc. And um, before the pandemic, at some point, I've thought, well, yeah, I can tell all these different things. I can show pictures, I can show photos, but um, is it really enough? 
what else could I do? And I come, came up with the idea of a non-formal Lithuanian language and culture club for non-Lithuanians. Um, it was a, a non-formal uh, club. We would just um, meet um, usually once per two weeks. And uh, the main participants were my students, their friends, their roommates, and also anyone interested in the Lithuanian language and um, culture. Um, we had and we, we still have um, a Facebook uh, account uh, where we would share various things. And I would also share um, different events. Uh, we would not only gather together and just talk, but um, we experienced, we tried out uh, some things all together. And what you can see here in the photo is our group celebrating Pancake Tuesday. Um, this is the same as uh, Mardi Gras or Carnival in some uh, countries. This is the kind of a Lithuanian way uh, we were making masks and um, we shared, um, of course, first what's typical to do um, on a Pancake Tuesday. We also had pancakes, by the way, uh, but also people shared how they celebrate Pancake Tuesday in their um, home countries. Do they have it in general? For some of them, it was a, a pretty unique experience. Um, what else? Um, we were also making um, the cold beetroot soup. Uh, those of you who are from Lithuania, uh, of course, you know um, uh, I'm not sure if you can recognize the word. Shaltas means cold. Borscht, <laughs> uh, this means uh, beetroot soup. And this is a cold beetroot soup really um, now uh, the season has already started the summer season this is the time when we Lithuanians um, enjoy this beetroot soup so we were making it of course we were also learning some Lithuanian uh, words like for example agurkas cucumber uh, or kiaušiniai eggs or krapai uh, dill or svogunu laiškai uh, spring onions and um, of course the surprising thing to non-Lithuanians is that this cold uh, soup is pink so they could see how come it's pink. Um, in uh, this photo you can see one more activity and this is um, painting eggs for Easter um, in Lithuania, we have a tradition to paint eggs. Uh, the traditional way would be to use wax, bee wax. So this is what we were doing. In other countries, as my students shared, uh, they can use pens or we can they can use pencils or they don't have this uh, tradition at all. So it was kind of a craft and, and an activity to try out. Um, um, focusing more on languages, uh, we played, uh, we, we, we used to play language games. Um, and how it worked? Well, these were quite common or uh, widely known uh, table games, but we adapted them a little bit to language learning. Uh, well, I mean alias, this is already for language learning, but let's say if you've played Uno, when you have to put the, 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 the card, uh, we also asked the students to say the color or to say the number in Lithuanian and uh, so on. So this was also a way to have fun, to enjoy, and at the same time to learn Lithuanian. Um, Something else, well, uh, here we were making candles before uh, All Saints Day. Um, and some Christmas decorations mm, from straw. 
uh, we had a, a really nice uh, workshop, um, you know, when everything glitters before uh, Christmas uh, with all the you know shiny and, and glittering um, Christmas decorations. Um, we got back to something very natural and we were engaged in in a traditionally Lithuanian, um, I would say art or craft of uh, making straw decorations. Um, I hope you can see the, the decoration in the hands of one of my uh, students. And again, this was a craft. Um, at the same time, we were also learning some words. Um, like Jirkles, scissors, um, uh, shaudas, straw, Jais uh, Lucas, decoration and so on and so forth. I, we were really glad, I was really glad to see how my students were trying to, to pack them and um, bring back to their home countries as a souvenir, as it was before Christmas, and um, they were simply getting back home. Um, so all these mm, all these uh, non-formal education activities. Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm a fan of, of these kind of activities. Um, in my opinion, they again develop the students' understanding, they develop the language skills, and they, mm, um, they involve students. And at some point, maybe you, you are not too, too interested in learning new vocabulary, but um, if someone explains to you some things in Lithuanian, if some uh, word is repeated over and over again, you want it or not, you like it or not, you remember it. And of course, all this experience of taking away uh, the cultural issues, taking away the uh, memories, I would say they mean a lot to students. Um, the next thing, also a non-formal education activity, um, is the so-called language tasters. A uh, language taster, and this is a phrase, a term that uh, we've come up with uh, at the Institute of Foreign Languages. It's an online event um, a pretty short event um, lasting for about 45 minutes. Uh, we held them every week. And um, the main point, the main idea was that international students or teachers uh, were telling, were representing their native language. They shared some interesting facts about their native language and also they were teaching some words or phrases in various languages. Why uh, do we need this, um, th these events and these activities? Well, at the Institute of Foreign Languages, uh, we uh, teach 20 to 24 languages each semester. However, not all languages are popular. Sometimes it, it happens, unfortunately, that we announce the group, um, we are planning a group, but um, simply the group is too small to open it. And uh, we've come up with this idea that, okay, uh, we cannot uh, open the group for one or another language and students don't have the possibility to, to learn it the whole semester. Uh, which is a quite uh, quite uh, uh, a big com commitment, but we can still spread the idea and we can still acquire the knowledge about languages and cultures. So the here you can see uh, some examples of the languages that um, we were talking about. Uh, for example, we had a meeting um, about Farsi, we had Kyrgyz, we have uh, Albanian, we had Danish, we had Czech, 
um, we had um, Japanese, we had Korean and so on and so forth. So this spring semester, uh, we had 10 uh, language tasters in total. And for example, uh, here you can see some examples in Farsi. And if you just have a look at uh, the words carefully, you can find some similarities between Lithuanian and Farsi. Yeah, just look at the Lithuanian word and at the word in Farsi. Yeah, the meaning in English is here. Yeah, shish and shesh. They're pretty similar, right? So this is what um, surprised both me, as frankly I didn't know anything about Farsi. Um, but it, it was also surprising to other participants, yeah? Kudikis and Kudak, yeah? Shaka and Shake. Um, so this, this was a real revelation to some of the uh, participants how distant at the first sight languages uh, can be, in fact, similar. Um, another example about the Czech uh, language um and some words some phrases to uh to learn in czech um so this is about language tasters right um a little bit about other initiatives uh, that we have at the institute of foreign languages that promote multilingualism that promote um, attention, I would say, to other languages and other cultures. We have um, various events that we organize with uh, schools. Um, uh, we also have tandem learning. Uh, at least we are trying to revive it and we're trying to implement it. Um, we have the so-called language cafe and I will tell briefly about it. And we also celebrate the European Day of Languages. Now, as for the events with, uh, with, with schools, uh, it, it happens that um, some event is organized. They're inviting us to participate. And what we do, we organize uh, some competition or some schools come to the Institute of Foreign Languages, to the university. Uh, we had an orientation game, for example, this semester, uh, when pupils from all Lithuania came to the university and they were playing orientation game. At the Institute of Foreign Languages, uh, we had an activity for them. Uh, they had to listen to songs in uh, different languages in various languages, and they had to guess what the language is. Um, so it, it was really funny to the pupils, to the uh, school children. It was also fun to us all. Um, sometimes we uh, relate all these events um, to the so-called language cafe format. Um, I'm not sure if, if, if you know what it is, uh, but by language cafe, we mean an informal way of uh, learning languages in an, in an informal environment. Um, people gather together, enjoy a cup of tea or coffee, some snacks, um, and they communicate, they talk on different uh, topics. Usually there's one topic um, covered at a time, even though it, 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 it may be different. And the use of all this is that, again, it's not formal learning, it's not about marks, it's not about um, evaluations, it's not about exams, it's simply to spend time together and to enjoy the language, the culture and each other's company. So sometimes when we go to schools, 
with our teachers, uh, with uh, international students, we use this language cafe format. Um, we bring uh, some some snacks or the school also make some tea for for the kids and um, we play language games. International students tell their stories. How come they? Um, they've decided to study in Lithuania, uh, why they've decided um, to come here on Erasmus or full time um, studies, etc. As for tandem, again, I'm not quite sure if you uh, know this this way of learning languages um, as the term suggests it's learning in pair. What fascinates me about this way of learning is that you can decide yourself when you're learning. Well, agree with your partner, of course, when you are learning, where you are learning. Maybe you can enjoy tea or coffee together. Maybe you can go jogging. Maybe you can meet in a park. Maybe you can meet in a gym um, and learn the language. This is what we um, are doing this semester. Uh, with the Ukrainian language. Mm, I'll tell it a little bit more about it uh, slightly later, but the, mm, it's, it, it works. <laughs> um, our experience now is that it, it, it works, people enjoy it, people are happy to meet each other, uh, to make friends. Um, from our part, we provide the material of learning Lithuanian as a foreign language and teaching Lithuanian as a foreign language and uh, learning Ukrainian. Um, we also suggest meeting at least once a week and spend half an hour learning one language and uh, another half an hour learning another language. Um, of course, well, we, we don't control uh, the process too much. Um, we can advise, we can consult, uh, we can help if, if there are some questions, uh, if um, let's say people are not quite sure how to explain one or another um, grammatical construction or word and so on. But generally it's not only about language learning, it's also about making a new friend enjoying the time together and spending uh, the time together. In our case, also expressing support to Ukraine. And the European Day of Languages, um, it's, um, it's, had, uh, uh, it, it's been organized at the Institute of Foreign Languages for years. This is our tradition, um, our celebration um, each year, um, September the 26th, and um, the, the format differs. Um, at, at, at some point, um, uh, some basketball matches were organized. Um, last year we had an, an event uh, for Transform for Europe, uh, Partners, maybe someone has participated in this event and the celebration as well. Um, we were uh, teaching uh, the, the languages of the Alliance, or actually different university. Each university uh, was giving a short presentation about the language. And we also had meetings with um, business enterprises um, where the participants could hear um, about the mm, practical need of languages, about the use of languages in uh, mm, various spheres of life, um, how they help people fi uh, finding jobs, um, improving their careers, etc. Uh, last year we also had a competition, uh, a short film, um, and a, a video competition, uh, uh, me, the pandemic and multilingualism. 
um, we were really happy to watch these videos and to celebrate this um, day this way. So these also could be some ideas maybe that you you could take up and use in in your context. Um, maybe you are already doing any any of these things uh, from our side. What, what what we believe is that this is a way of spreading the idea about languages and language learning. So again, that why all these extracurricular activities? Why all these non formal education activities? Of course, we can think of a lot of reasons. Um, what's really important in, in, in my opinion, or this is my, my view, that it's a, a fun and engaging way of learning languages. Uh, well, learning by doing or experiencing both the language and the culture, like tasting the language, um, well, it, it motivates, it, it, it engages. This is at least what I hear from um, our students. They uh, also raise cultural awareness and I would say teach the students to appreciate each other's culture and to appreciate the differences that uh, that they have. At the same time, when you learn something by doing or when you experience all these um, things together, they create a sense of community and in my opinion, we need this sense of community. We need this uh, sense of um, friendship. Uh, we need the sense of commonness in uh, in the contemporary world, uh, just to promote not only languages and cultures, but also human values. And this actually leads to one more point that I wanted to talk about compassionate linguistics and um, most probably you haven't heard about it. Um, this is something new that that we are experiencing in this world in, in general. Um, the term compassionate linguistics may sound strange, right? but it was actually created by Lithuanian um, emigre uh, and writer and artist and translator Lima Vince Suraginis. Um, she created the, the this term and uh, explains it, defines it as the desire to learn another's language out of a sense of empathy, support, and uh, mutual respect. Um, well, if you are if you are interested, uh, the whole article, the the whole blog post, uh, can be found here, or you could simply uh, enter limavince.com, um, and you'll be able to find many other articles and her paintings and, um, and, and, and drawings. Um, of course, we could discuss the, the term itself. Um, can linguistics be a desire? Um, maybe it's not um, super accurate, right? Uh, but we do have the phenomenon uh, these days. Maybe I would refer to it as compassionate language learning. What um driving it and how come this compassionate linguistics or this compassionate language learning is developing? Um, so. As we all know, the war started on February the 24th uh, in Ukraine. And um, little by little, uh, the war refugees have started to come to Lithuania. What I heard from them is that, well, they want to at least 
to learn to read in Lithuanian. In Ukraine, they use a Cyrillic alphabet. And when you walk along the streets and corners, you may not be able to read even the street names properly. And uh, we've come up with the idea, how could we help? And the way to help was to collect a group of volunteers who can learn, uh, sorry, who can teach Lithuanian as a foreign language. Um, I was super happy when a um, large number, um, around 40 people in Konas and um, even more, maybe 60 people in Vilnius, um, replied to this request and they agreed uh, to, to try and teach Lithuanian for Ukrainians as um, on a voluntary basis. Um, in Konas, as I coordinate all these activities in Konas, um, now we've, we have um, 20 groups of um, Lithuanian uh, language. Some of them have already completed the course. Uh, some of these groups are still working. Uh, the duration of the course is 30 academic hours. And in the group, uh, we have approximately 20 people. Um, in Vilnius, the situation with the numbers is um, pretty the same, uh, a little bit higher numbers, but um, still the demand, the, the need to learn Lithuanian um, is really big. On the other hand, we noted that we Lithuanians also need the Ukrainian language. Why? Because some families accommodated Ukrainians. Some people work at registration centers. Uh, some people are volunteering. Uh, some people work at uh, kindergartens or schools and they need to talk to kids in Ukrainian. Uh, not all Lithuanians know Russian. Uh, which is quite a common language among Ukrainians. Um, so all in all, what we did, uh, we first wanted to try out if there is this need uh, to learn Ukrainian. Um, for two or three semesters, we were suggesting Ukrainian uh, during the semester. However, the interest was not so very high. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't open the groups and now we said, well, maybe let's let's try, let's see. And we were thinking, we were planning one group only. Uh, what happened was that in less than three hours, 120 people registered. And what do we do with all this? Um, we gathered a group of um, Ukrainians, of students who uh, study at Vitotas Magnus University of Alumni. Um, later, other Ukrainians joined the initiative and they agreed to teach Ukrainian to Lithuanians, again, on a voluntary basis. Um, as for the material, um, well, with Lithuanian, uh, it's, it's, it's not a big problem. Uh, we do have uh, enough material to teach it. However, uh, there was a problem with Ukrainian initially and I'm extremely thankful uh, to the students who were preparing the material. Um, if you remember when I was talking about tandem learning, um, there was one Ukrainian lady, a translator. Uh, she's in Ukraine at the moment and she's agreed to translate, to adapt the material or create the material to teach Ukrainian. And, you know, she's in, in the middle of the war, but she still is volunteering. She's also now teaching Ukrainian and she devoted her, her time, her energy um, as a sign of help to us as well um, and was preparing all, all the material and teaching at the same time. So this is what the writer 
um, what Slima Vincent Sloginis means by compassionate linguistics, or as maybe I, I would modify it, compassionate language learning. Um, this is not like the, um, you know, the actual need that that you have based on, I don't know, some economic reasons or some career development reasons. This is a sense of empathy, of support and mutual respect. So as I've mentioned, we have uh, like uh, 20 groups of people who learn Lithuanian. We have seven groups of uh, Lithuanians who learn Ukrainian. We have tandem learning Lithuanian Ukrainian pairs, 35 pairs, and we also have something else that you can see, I hope, in the photo. Um, it's a pity I don't see um, our chat now, so uh, maybe someone would like to or could unmute and just guess What's this in the photo? What can you see here? I don't hear any guesses. Um, so this is uh, the so-called camouflage net. Um, it's made for protection. The fighters uh, use it to cover uh, themselves and, and and hide of course if you're close it's um, really you know uh, recognizable it's it's visible that it's not the grass for example but if uh, someone looks at it from from a drone or from some aircraft um, of course it's it's difficult to see it to, uh, to 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 note that something's different with uh, something's unusual with the surface. So at the Institute of Foreign Languages, we started making these nets at the end of March. Um, and we started with one construction. Um, people donated material, others uh, made these constructions. Now we have these constructions on all three floors of the Institute. Um, we also encourage school children uh, to come and help making these nets. Um, and they not only make the net. Um, what I personally like about this initiative is that they also learn some Ukrainian uh, there are usually Ukrainian um, women with uh, children um, working with the nets and the, the, the pupils, the school children that come to the Institute, they also learn some Ukrainian. For the people who make the net, as they call, this is a certain um, Ukrainian art therapy um, because you uh, you do some do some craft, right? Um, you communicate, you cry, you share, you laugh, you tell some joke, and um, at the same time you also do something useful. Yeah, so some more pictures, and as I uh, say um, to to my friends, to my colleagues, it's not only about the craft, it's not only about the art. This is also the space where we can experience multilingualism. Um, it's not something that we can read about in an article. It's not something that we can watch on some um, video. It's something real. It's something authentic. Why? Because um, the women, the, the people who make the nets, um, they don't always speak English. As for me personally, as for our administrators, 
um well i i do understand um well we don't speak ukrainian <laughs> um i i can understand russian but i had difficulty speaking the language our administrators don't understand and don't speak russian um at all and what do you do if people come and want to ask something about the language course uh they want to ask about studies at the university and then what do you do you just look at the person and smile well no <laughs> you have to say something um so we've ended well i cannot say we've ended up uh, we continue all this um mixing languages or trans languaging right um it it happens it does happen that we start a sentence in russian and then we need some word uh, then we add it in uh, english or in lithuanian um or we start saying something in english and then switch to uh, lithuanian or maybe to ukrainian as well so to me personally this is a way not only to hear, not only to read about multilingualism, about translanguaging, but also to survive it, to experience it, actually, to hear all these authentic stories uh, of the people who, who are doing all this. And we also have some kids who come and spend time when their moms are, are making the net um they are sometimes you know it feels like some kindergarten here but the kids also learn um and they they were playing scrabble using lithuanian words and you can already see a lithuanian word labas which means hi hello in lithuania so they managed to uh to uh arrange it um on on the board. Um, also, uh, what we have on the wall is a uh, short vocabulary. We have important, um, you know, more um, frequent words or phrases in Ukrainian, as you can see in the um, Cyrillic alphabet. Then we can see the transliteration in Latin alphabet, and then we can see the translation into Lithuanian. So for example, this means, hello, what's your name? My name, nice to meet you. Where are you from? I'm from Lithuania, Ukraine. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Please repeat. I have a brother and a sister. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye and good luck. Yeah, so these are the main phrases that we have attached to the wall. And uh, when making the nets, uh, people can learn some words, some phrases in Ukrainian. And also we have um one more page um where people can add their own words maybe they they need one or another word for example this means great or uh see you and i'm sure everyone's already familiar with slava ukraine glory to ukraine so it's it's also possible to add more words more phrases more expressions um so these these are the initiatives these are the uh the activities uh that that we organize at the institute at at the moment and this is what could be referred as compassionate language learning or at the same time as a space as um as some activities uh, to promote multilingualism and, as I've mentioned, to experience multilingualism. Now, I'd like to um, round up little by little 
to your emails, you had to receive one more link. Please open this link and please write your um, takeaway message. So maybe you've heard something interesting today. Maybe you use some other ways, some other methods to encourage multilingualism. Um, so please share your ideas. Please share your pieces of advice for uh, uh, with other colleagues. I see some of you are writing. Let's wait a little bit. I'd like to conclude on my idea that has just popped up um, that foreign students always are eager to share something about their country. Uh, I suppose we all agree on this and it can be related to any topic. Um, business in my country, history of my country. Well, definitely yes. Like these um, experiences or if um, let's say if, um, if it's you know in, in the form of some either poster or padlet uh, let's say or some other platform uh, where they can write their ideas mm, I would say it would be really beneficial I mean not only discussions but uh, also some some artifact yeah like like Padlet or some poster in class. So thanks. Thanks for the ideas. Thanks for sharing. So I would like to finish on a philosophical kind of philosophical note is that languages as as I teach languages, this is my my subject this is what what i do in this life they well sometimes we focus on grammar a lot sometimes we focus on vocabulary a lot and of course we do need all this that's for sure however i would say languages are more these are not only the rules to follow these these are not only um the activities to do but it's Languages are about communication. Languages are about experiences. Languages are about sharing, about human values, about cultural differences and similarities, and about memories. This is what I usually tell my students at the end of the course. That, you know, realistically, if you continue learning Lithuanian, um, of course, you will improve. You will um, reach higher levels. However, if you don't practice, if you just um, stop here and now, well, little by little, you will forget it. But if after 10 or 20 or 30 years, you remember at least some words, like labas, hello, achu, Thank you, Iki, bye, and so on. Well, I'll be happy as a teacher. And if you remember that you had great experiences, if you bring the memories in, in your minds and in, in your hearts uh, in your future life, I'll be also happy, very happy as a person. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your attention for uh, spending this time together, for uh, sharing your ideas. Thanks everyone. And if you have some questions, I suppose we also have a, a, a little bit of time to discuss. Thank you, Thank Teresa. You. Yes, of course, I suppose we have a couple of minutes to to discuss or to raise some questions or some doubts or something else so everyone is welcome to ask Teresa something or just to share your impression 
Uh, hello, uh, Teresa. It was very interesting to hear you. And of course, um, at Uki, I think we're quite often trying to use multilingual ideas. But one of the things that is a big concern to me is how to avoid superfer superficiality, because sometimes these experiences and exchanges can be very at a very superficial level. Do you have any strategies that would allow to uh, experience multilingual? Lingualism at a slightly deeper level, and how do you encourage when you sometimes see that students maybe overgeneralize? Well, thank, by you. The th thank you so much, uh, and that's a really great uh, question. Um, I'm afraid there's no easy answer. Uh, uh, well, because mm, you know what I'm trying to do personally, um, I'm trying to react to my students as well if uh, some topic just naturally pops up uh, then of course we develop it um, slightly further um, sometimes even though it's superficial well sometimes i i do encourage i do ask questions um, and, you know, if, if, if I see that, well, maybe this is not the perfect timing, the, the students are not too responsive or maybe they are tired whatsoever. Of course, I, I we cannot push <laughs> and uh, continue on, on the really superficial level, but um, at least, well, maybe that's that's my experience. Um, people are eager to share. People are eager to ask questions, and if this um, uh, discussion uh, continues, of course, it's, it's it's more than welcome. And of course, some exercises, some well, some you know, input uh, to stimulate the discussion, some input to encourage the discussion. Well, I, I suppose this is something that uh, that we can do and maybe we also should do to a certain extent of course 